This is Dave, and I'm here with Ethan, and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, episode 218-inch. On this episode, we conclude our interview with Colin Davis, the former head of Scripted Originals at the Roku channel, who helped Greenlight weird the Al Yankovic story. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. Weird Al you don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Well, hello, Ethan. How has your week been? You know, as someone in an Emmy Award winning film? Honestly, it's very cool, but it's not nearly as cool as getting to be in a project that I'm so incredibly fond of the end product, the vision, and everyone who worked on it. I agree with you 100%. It can't feel any better than February 14th, 2022, when we were first on the set contributing to such an incredible piece of art and Weird Al history. Now, we didn't get great news on Monday, but it was still Weird Al related. So let's get on to what's happening in Weird Al related news. The 75th Primetime Emmy Awards were held live this past Monday, January 15th, airing on Fox. And Weird the Al Yankovic story was right robbed of both of its remaining categories. While Weird the Al Yankovic story did not win Outstanding Writing for a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie, nor did Daniel Radcliffe win for Outstanding Lead Actor in a Limited or Anthology Series or Movie, in our hearts and in our minds, and you better just go along with it if we say they won, they are the true winners. For now, that means that Weird the Al Yankovic story took home two out of the eight Emmys it was nominated for, which is incredibly cool and still pretty stinking majestic. We are still holding hope that a recount will occur, as well as future Weird the Al Yankovic story Emmy wins for lifetime achievement, and that they will retroactively add the award for 2023 Best Background Acting Duo. And we are also here to apologize on behalf of our no good, stinky, piece of crud intern Frank. Of course, Weird Losing to Beef is all intern Frank's fault, and we can't help but feel partially responsible. If only we had just demeaned him just a little bit more, the scales of karma could have tipped in Weird the Al Yankovic story's favor. Do not worry, intern Frank will be dealt with. Oh, he will be dealt with, all right. He won't get away that easily. Oh, he won't get away that easily, all right. He just makes me... Oh, he just makes me... All right. Uh, Let's just change the subject, Dave, because all this talk about the Emmys is just too much for me. Okay, okay, changing the subject. This past Saturday, January 13th, an edited presentation of the 75th Primetime Creative Arts Emmy Awards aired on FXX. The broadcast included the Emmy for Outstanding Music Composition for a Limited or Anthology Series, Movie, or Special Original Dramatic Score, of which past guests of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, composers Leo Bierenberg and Zach Robinson won! Leo and Zach gave a quick speech in which they thanked episode 2000-inch guest Weird Al Yankovic and past guest of Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, our very own director, Eric Capel, among others. The broadcast also included the Emmy for Outstanding Television Movie, which, of course, Weird the Al Yankovic story very deservedly won! When the award winner was announced, Al stood up, hugged his daughter Nina, and kissed his wife Suzanne, who were sitting in the audience with him. Eric Capel gave a touching speech in which he thanked Al and many others who worked on the film, as well as, quote, our incredible cast. From both Ethan and me, you are very welcome, Eric. Eric also gave thanks to this episode's and last episode's guest, Colin Davis, the former head of scripted programming at Roku. Weird Al's real-life speech mirrored that of his namesake's acceptance speech in Weird the Al Yankovic story. However, it is unclear if Weird Al urinated on himself or was brutally murdered as the special was edited for a time. During the special, Al, Suzanne, and Nina were shown several times in the audience, including within the first three minutes of the broadcast. 
Emmys.com posted videos of the acceptance speeches, along with some additional footage backstage called the Thank You Cam for additional thanks and acknowledgments. Weird Al thanked each of his longtime band members by name, but then just haphazardly lumped us in by thanking everybody in the cast. Well, not to worry, though. Weird Al did thank us by name during the DVD and Blu-ray commentary, complimenting our, quote, naturalistic performances, going on to say it was a, quote, big reason why our movie got eight Emmy nominations, so thank you guys. And once again, from all of us here at Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, a huge congratulations to Al, Eric, Leo, Zach, everyone who worked on Weird the Al Yankovic story, and of course, everybody in the cast. In additional Weird the Al Yankovic story related news, Weird the Al Yankovic story is finally available to watch in France and Switzerland. If this applies to you, you can watch it right now via OCS or ACS, the French pay television networks. And if any of our overseas listeners do watch, please let us know if they've translated our award winning fist bumps into French or Switzerlish or whatever they speak in Switzerland. Weird Al showed up at the premiere of past guest, friend of the podcast, and our co-star in Weird the Al Yankovic Story, Jonah Ray's brand new film, Destroy All Neighbors. Jonah stars in the comedy horror film, which made its premiere last week at Beyond Fest. And the film is available now on Shudder if you want to check it out. As a reminder, this coming weekend, Weird Al is scheduled to be taking part in three events at San Francisco Sketchfest. On Saturday, January 20th, Weird Al will be performing the Middle-Aged Dad Jam Band with Ken Marino, David Wayne, and special guests Kevin Allison, Carrie Kenny Silver, Thomas Lennon, Jolo Trulio, and more. And on the morning of Sunday, January 21st, Weird Al will be joining children's author-illustrator Mo Willems for a morning of comedy, books, music, and doodles, along with Pamela Adlin, W. Kamau Bell, Carrie Kenny Silver, Joe Latrulio, and Dulce Slug. And later that evening, Weird Al will be a celebrity panelist, along with Adam Savage of Mythbusters fame, on Triumph the Insult Comic Dog's live quiz show podcast, Let's Make a Poop. Can't make it to San Francisco this weekend? Well, Veeps.com's got you covered as they'll be live streaming Triumph's Let's Make a Poop event on their website. You can head to Veeps.com for tickets and more information. And if you can make it to San Francisco this weekend, our very own Ethan Ullman will be attending these events in person. So if you too are attending, please stop by and say hello and pick up a few wooden nickels for you to poop on! And now it's time for What's Happening in Steve J. What a Guy Related News! This month marks the 73rd birthday of Weird Al's longtime bass player, Steve J. Steve is, of course, an accomplished bassist, having released 11 solo albums of his own, in addition to three highly acclaimed archival field recordings. Steve's birthday falls later this month on January 26th. So from all of us here at Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, happy birthday, Steve! This episode is brought to you in part by Vegan Burrito Restaurant, Burrito Burrito, home of the two-pound, double-wrapped in a quesadilla, Burrito Burrito, and Wizard Burger in Albany, New York. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger for mouth-watering, loaded, dare I say beefy, vegan burgers. From Albany to Uranus, Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger feed the hungry with out-of-this-world, plant-based, real food, always vegan style. Visit BurritoSquared.com and WizardBurger.com to order ahead. And now it's time for What's Happening in Dave and Ethan's 2000-Inch Weird Al Podcast-Related News! If you're in the official Dave and Ethan's 2000-Inch Weird Al Podcast Facebook group over at group.2000inch.com, you may have already seen pictures of what we consider to be one of the most pretty stinking majesticest tattoos ever. Our close personal friend Jill Hinton, on her journey to get a Weird Al tattoo sleeve, has gotten the world's first ever Dave and Ethan's 2000-Inch Weird Al Podcast tattoo. You may remember Jill from Ridiculously Self-Indulgent Bonus Episode 45 Centimeter, our review of Weird Al's concert in Nashville, Indiana from February 3rd, 2023. 
Adding to her incredible collage of Weird Al imagery and inside jokes is our 2000 inch logo. Now right now it's just a black outline, but Jill plans to get it filled in with color later this year. We are absolutely honored that Jill decided to ink our iconic logo on her arm just above Boba Fett playing clarinet. From all of us here at Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast, thank you, Jill, and congratulations on the pretty stinking majestic tattoo. To see some photos of her pretty stinking majestic tattoos, be sure to head over to group.2000inch.com. Okay, now it's time to continue our interview with former head of scripted originals at Roku, our friend Colin Davis. Let's pick up the interview where we left off on the last episode already in progress. You said that the heat off of some of the publicity that you guys were getting was an early indicator. When was it sort of officially like, okay, this is a big deal? I mean, it was it was for me from the beginning. I think, you know, partly because of the spend, right? Again, small, small in comparison to, you know, what you see for, you know, big features and stuff. However, for Roku to spend this much money on a film, they'd never done that before. So I think, you know, their willingness to to help me get that money to get it greenlit and to to get it going was already their first sign that they wanted to invest in this and make this work. Um and, you know, I think once once you get a little bit of momentum, you're like, "All right, let's direct more of the resources that we have." Let's let's break rules that we had had before of, you know, we can't have this thing on for this, you know, this period of time, mm. you know, because it dis- it displaces something else. You know, let's allow uh, this. We had T-Mobile came in and sponsored it. Let's, you know, work with T-Mobile to to use their resources to help make it, you know, larger mm. and bigger. I mean, we had never thrown a premiere before. You know, we had never we had never done that stuff before um, at, at this scale by any means, you know, uh, I think the only thing I will quickly just sidebar is that we did this Zoe's Extraordinary Christmas movie, um, great group of people, great creator, uh, which was um, also very well received, got nominated for an Emmy too, uh, which was an extension of that TV show um, that got canceled. And that was at the time the most we had ever done and was like our first kind of experience going through that process. Um, The first time that, you know, Roku, which had traditionally been a, uh, well, is a device company, it's an advertising company, and it's, it's, its content was all library. It was like first time going through a starting from the beginning, going all the way to airing um, on, a, on a movie. And so that, that really helped, I think, um, work out some, some kinks, um, you know, and us experiencing um, just things we could do with, uh, with Roku as a platform to help make sure the viewership um, did well. Now, I think the only criticism that we can share about Weird is we were really disappointed that there was not a theatrical run. And I, I know Al and Eric had talked about that. Is that something that you can speak to? Is, is, was that something that, that you were involved in? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I totally understand that criticism. And I've, I talked to Al about it. I talked to Eric about it. And, you know, I think it's totally fair for them to, to, to have, you know, those grievances and to want to have those experiences. And you, like I, got to also watch it in a theater in New York and in some of these screenings and stuff and, and got to experience the, the fervor and joy um, around seeing it with a group of people. I think, you know, first and foremost, Roku is a uh, TV company. I mean, we quite literally manufacture TVs as part of our business. <laughs> right. Um, so, you know, it, there was a period of time when Netflix and Apple and and those streamers also didn't have theatrical releases. I think that was something Netflix did for the first time for Scorsese to work with Scorsese <laughs> um, mm. is when they started uh-huh. doing that. You know, I think the there's a couple things that happen with a theatrical release. Um, First off, you are actually making different deals, um, which we had not made originally made deals for that to to be done. You know, and I think I think at the time of us, you know, greenlighting it and getting it going, you know, there wasn't much like, oh, let's let's also ask for this thing now because I, they were so kind and grateful and so happy this was getting made that we weren't having that conversation up front. Um, I think it takes a lot of planning. Like we would have had to do um, a lot more work. In it, we would have had to wait longer for that, for it to come out. 
because we would have needed to spend more money on marketing. And I, I think, you know, obviously this is something that we've also had seen some conversations around. I think we also very much felt like this hopefully was a shoe in for a variety of Emmy awards and there is the risk and there has been, and there is the rules that if you are in a movie theater and you do a theatrical release, you don't qualify for the Emmys. Oh, interesting. And okay. I think, yeah. So there's a piece of that where, you know, don't get me wrong, how amazing would it have been for Oscar qualifications and who knows <laughs> what we would have qualified for. Right. But it was, but, but, but it very much felt like there's a bird in hand with these Emmy noms um, that was not necessarily going to be as obvious with Oscar opportunities. And that goes to people beyond, you know, Al too. You know, I think to see like Zach and Leo get nominated, to see, you know, uh, Eric and Al get nominated for co-writing, you know, like that that's an Emmy nomination that I don't think would have been an, an Oscar nomination. So there was conversations around you know, awards and where awards work. There was conversations around the logistics of doing that and how that would happen. Um, there was conversations about Roku existentially as being a TV company. Um, so I know we definitely deprived um, an audience from that experience. Uh, and I, I, I don't love that that happened, but I also think that there was a lot of um, value to the other side of it, which is all that we got mm. um, on, the, on the Emmy side, on the TV side. And we also could have had an experience where, you know, it didn't have a successful theatrical showing. I don't know if that would have been the case, but if, if for some reason we put it in theaters and we didn't sell out and it didn't, you know, and it kind of fizzled there, it could have severely impacted the streaming release. I feel a lot better about it. Thank you. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> and, <that's, laughs> and, and I'm not trying to take a full side here. I'm just trying to paint the, the more macro picture because I, 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 I do. I like, I mean... I, I saw what it was like to watch with a bunch of Al fans dressed right. up in costume, <laughs> right. laughing at that. And it's helpful, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy with comedy, right? Like when you watch with other people, they help make sure that you don't miss a joke because you've got more people catching things. Yeah. And especially with some of those Easter eggs in there too, you know, we're like, do you, do we know if people know what song we're referencing here? And, um, you know, I'm sure there are many people who missed a lot when they were watching at home because they didn't get to sit in a, in a theater watching it. I mean, I just went and watched, you know, Saltburn, for example, in the theater. And I'm telling you, that is not a movie I would have uh, wanted to have watched uh, at home. Only in that, like watching with a the theater and seeing the reactions of people to all those scenes was part of the, the joy. So, mm. um, yeah, that's just me saying, like, there's obviously a, there's a big picture to, to this whole thing. You know, I uh, by no means um, have any uh, negative feelings about people wanting it to have been in the theaters. I think there's a lot of me that wanted that. But I think for all those varieties of reasons that I spelled out, that's why the decision to not do it was made. And honestly, you know, the, the consolation prize of TIFF and the Alamo Draft House premieres and some of the other screenings that happened is really cool because even having that opportunity was incredible. And I know every single person that I've talked to just absolutely loved seeing it with a, a, a fun audience like that. As did I. I think I've seen this movie... I mean, over a hundred <laughs> times, um, and 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 seeing it, seeing it in the theater, uh, I I kept going back to every screening I could because it was, it was just really cool. I think watching, you know, there was a a screening that I, I think Funny or Die hosted that had just the whole kind of comedy community out there, and mm-hmm. um, that was really cool as well because it was, I don't know, I think probably there was a bunch of people in that audience that you know, passed on it or wanted to buy it, but for some reason couldn't make that happen. And I, I kind of felt a little bit uh, rewarded for the <laughs> risk that didn't even feel like a risk. Yeah. Um, getting right. to see it, it like amongst, amongst my community and seeing everyone respond to it so favorably. <laughs> getting to see it in a theater was certainly a special. You needed to be there moments and it was definitely cool seeing it in a theater. And also very nice to have it on a streaming platform that you can literally watch anywhere. You know, you can just show up at somebody's house, uh, flip on the, you know, the Roku channel and watch the film with them. So it's, it's really amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's no barrier to entry. Like I, that was like so important, you know, especially having worked at a company that was, you know, going to be charging people money to, to subscribe. Having gone to Roku after that, I was like, oh, this is this literally, if people want to watch it, it is in their fingertips to watch and you can watch it a variety of different ways. Um, and, and no barrier to entry is really, was really important. 
How much influence did Roku have on the film? Now, you said Eric and Al came to you with a script, I'm assuming a script that was pretty close to finalized, if not finalized. What uh, say does Roku have? Can they say, cut this scene or add something else here? Or is it pretty much uh, Al and Eric's project to run with? Um, we can, and we do. Uh, and that is kind of how it works, you know, to a degree. One is, right. is like, we're paying for it. So it's like, <laughs> hey, like, you know, <laughs> you're paying for it, so... So you do have a level of influence uh, for that. And then also, too, is, you know, kind of your job, at least the way I see it, is to kind of be the first articulate audience for it. Um, You know, you are, I always say, like, my job is to be uh, a coach. Um, I never Mm. played the game. Uh, You know, I can't can't shoot the three. I can't dunk the basketball. But I can tell you, hey, you're really good at shooting the three and you're trying to dunk right now. Um, and or you're wide open over here if you just look that direction. So, um, yes, like, do we give do we have the ability to give notes and kind of command certain creative things? Sure. Um, uh, that's not usually the way I like to operate. And uh, this this experience creatively for me, um, it was just in such good hands the whole way through. You know, Eric is I had worked with him. We, we had such a shorthand al is obviously one of a kind they were making something so so great and as they've t- talked about too i think keeping each other in check as well you know you've got producers weighing in and we gave notes on the cuts and stuff but the notes you know are really like i laughed here or i didn't fully laugh here why mm. is that um you know mm. this scene didn't you know didn't fully track into that moment or you know, where it just kind of felt a little longer than it needed to be in these places. Um, I, I think that's really where you know we could be helpful. And even that, I don't even know if the feedback I gave, you know, ultimately helped shape it, or if they were going to get to that conclusion anyway. I don't. There wasn't. We didn't give notes that you know they contested when we got to like the cut of it. Um, we were always on the same page about. Mm the casting choices that they were making. They were, you know, they were sending people that they wanted to, to put in. And, you know, technically we have approval, right? So we would approve them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think there was really ever a moment where we're like, not that person. And I think it's just because they had such a handle on it. I completely um, agreed with their casting approach of, you know, not casting just like the silliest people in all these roles, but having it played straight, especially like that core group was, you know, I mean, uh, Julian Nicholson, Nicholson was uh, in uh, Mayor of Easttown playing an incredibly dark role um, before right. this. And, and you know, I think what was great about it is all those actors that could do both comedy and drama um, understood the assignment. Uh, or maybe I didn't see, you know, Al and Eric working it out with them more, but they all knew how to, to play it and make it work. And I think there was just a real consciousness about you know, where these moments are happening. What's funny, I, I will say, you know, the, the scene that sticks out to me, and I love it, but also feels kind of like the, the silliest tonally um, is the pool party scene, um, just because it is kind of everything being thrown in at once with all these different characters. <laughs> yes. and, it, and it gets kind of, kind of, it gets kind of wacky and kind of wild um, where, you know, the, the scenes leading up to that hadn't, gotten to, to that place yet and you know there is the uh famous for your listeners uh you know the the accordion shot that eric um i know has talked about about like give me my accordion and those three accordions pop in and right. they yep. decided to cut it because that just felt a little bit non-diegetic to the tone they were doing I, I think there was another scene too where you know he was going to turn in the uh turn in the the demo and he like pushes and pushes a lady in his process to doing that. And it was also kind of silly and very funny. And I hope people get to see, get to see those, those scenes, but you know, they, they got to those conclusions to, to not use those themselves. That was not, you know, some kind of contentious network battle um, right. by any means. So no, it's this, this, you know, it's my job does involve giving notes for sure. But I mean, I, I had, this was just such, a, I, I watched all of this from a fan, all a fans perspective, all the feedback I gave, you know, got to be from a fan's perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing, nothing, weir- you know, scarier than, you know, sending, uh, hey, you're all like, you know, my little like time code thoughts to 
Al, who, you know, <laughs> could easily brush me off, um, given everything that he's done and that he's accomplished. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I don't think I had really anything to do with creatively shaping this um, beyond just being a fan and just trying my best to enable a vision that they were very clear at yeah. uh, trying to accomplish and execute. Hmm. Now, day to day, as they're filming, as they're editing, are you joining them on set? Did you have that opportunity? I did. Yes. I mean, I am. I am watching what are called dailies. So every day, I'm watching. You know what they had shot. Um, they get kind of uploaded after uh, after a day of shooting, so I can go and look at them. Uh, I went and visited set a couple times. I didn't. I didn't stay on set all the time. I think. You know, um, I, I was there for I think three days of of the very short shoot i went for the pool party scene which was a blast uh and it was and let me just say this like it's it i've been on many a sets now this set was so warm so f comedy forward so collaborative i mean al there every moment you know dan I, the, so i was there the last day that dan was there and he wrapped up his scene and he could have been a star as we've all stereotyped stars and been like, all right, peace out, you know, or could have gone to his trailer, but instead he hung around with people. He was working with young Al, showing him some accordion tricks. Oh, and wow. And was just, you know, and, and it's just, oh. it, it's a testament to Dan, but it's also a testament to the set that they created and the experience they were having. I mean, if, if everything I work on uh, and get to be a part of can have the energy, the, the creativity, and just the vibes that this had, um, I mean, this would be truly the best job ever. Wow. We recently chatted with Eric Appel about the film in a, a pretty extensive interview, and he said that he would be open to the possibility of working with Al again, you know, outside of the, the weird universe. You know, you, as of early 2023, now work at Sony. Your position is Executive Vice President of Comedy Development at Sony Pictures Television Studios. Do you think that maybe we could wish upon a star to see you working with them again i mean i would i would absolutely love that of course um uh i can't i can't say that there's any any um tangible things happening at this moment but you know i i, I still talk to especially eric fairly regularly um you know al and i have exchanged some nice notes um uh since i left roku and you know i would be happy to be any sort of uh behind the scenes uh, champion and enabler of, of something they would want to do together. It, like I said, such a joy and so, so great and, you know, never contentious, always, um, always warm. I mean, Al is everything that uh, he has a reputation for and more. And um, Eric is so creative and collaborative um, in the way that he worked with Al, but the way that he's worked with other people, but also one of those people that has a strong vision too. you know, Eric fights for things that he believes in. Um, and you know, you want to work with people who, who have that, that, um, that POV. Yeah. Ethan mentioned that, you know, some fans were a little disappointed that there wasn't a theatrical release of Weird Al Yankovic story. Uh, one thing I was hoping for, and I know Ethan was hoping for it too, was some more like merchandise or, or other things. Do you have any insight why maybe Roku didn't put out sort of more merchandise or go that route uh, with this film? It's a good question. I, I don't really, um, I can make some guesses, um, you know, I think that's part of the product of being a new platform. I think there are uh, always kind of legalities around likeness and and who is what. You know, I think both Dan and Al have such a pre-existing um, footprint and reputation and, you know, just image likeness out there that I don't know if it... Um, Made, and I'm, I'm now just guessing if it made sense for Roku to try to collaborate in that process. Um, you know, this is obviously an original film, but, you know, that combination, uh, both both those folks have, you know, merchandise out there um, in ways that are well beyond mm -hmm. us. So, I, you know, yeah. I, think, I, I think, you know, chalk it up to New Place, a studio that hasn't, you know, traditionally made a bunch of merch surrounding a project and you know the 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 legal 
uh, tape of trying to stand that stuff up is a, is a lot harder than let's just make a t-shirt and print it or let's just, you know, there's, there's a lot of approvals. There's a lot of cooks in that kitchen. There's a lot of lawyers in that process. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, and then there's a lot of projections of, is this going to, again, be profitable, which I think is an, an annoying, but an important part of all these equations is, you know, we're doing this for, um, for money, <laughs> um, <laughs> right. uh, and not just for, you know, uh, fandom. I have a, a feeling that maybe some uh, Roku executives may listen to this interview and be like, what is Colin going to say about us? So for those of you Roku people listening, make us some merchandise. Make it happen. <laughs> we would love it. <laughs> I'll put in my wish for some Hey Boy action figures. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I will be first first to buy one of those yeah. for sure. Uh... Well, that's three Roku that you can sell. <laughs> 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 at least three i'm sure a lot more now, colin in your position now at sony pictures television studios is there any upcoming projects that you can tell us about that you're working on you know i got i i think uh, i have to keep some of that stuff under wraps i can you know i'm very excited that twisted metal got a second season pickup very recently um platonic um just got a pickup which is awesome so uh those are those came through um, the comedy department before I was there, but are, you know, continuing successfully. So um, those are new seasons that we can be on the lookout for um, when they finally do air. I saw Twisted Metal after we talked to Zach and Leo and they mentioned they did the music for it and it was incredible. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to a uh, second season. Yeah, Zach and Leo are so great. They they are very much part of uh, the Sony family and in, in, in projects that they work on. So I've actually, you know, even ran into them uh at a screening for Obliterated, which is another project that just dropped on Netflix oh, not cool. that long ago. So um, they're they're um, so talented and, and so so great, and I'm so glad that I've now gotten to collide with them uh, again in a new job. Yeah, that's so great. That's so great. Now, now, I don't know how often you use your X account, formerly Twitter, but I did notice that your 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 bio it says that your favorite Stanleys in order are flat. Kubrick and Yelnats, and I, I noticed the omission of Stanley Spadowski uh, from UHF, Michael Richards' character. <laughs> Care to elaborate on that for us? <laughs> oh gosh, you guys are you guys are sleuthing. Um, I think I, I think I put that I think I put that up in like 2011 when Twitter first came out. I think I had that on a dating profile at one point in time. Um, uh, I'm not a frequent frequent use like at least frequent. Uh, content tweeter um but i uh yeah i mean gosh maybe you have to go back and and reevaluate that um you know comedy 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 works in threes so i had to choose choose three and uh i'm gonna have to live with that omission (laughs) Uh, i'm glad that you're you're owning up to it and (laughs) recognizing your mistake (laughs) you know it's it's funny. I got a call from Stanley Tucci the other day. He was also upset. So, uh, you know, there's. <laughs> well, Colin, this has just been it's such an incredible experience getting to hear a side of things that certainly Dave and I have not gotten to hear and, and ask about before. So we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us and open up about what is the greatest movie of all time. <laughs> Uh, I, I agree, and, and thank you for, for letting me uh, letting me talk about it. It is truly just um, the greatest joy to be able to, and what an experience, and what a bunch of you know incredible people behind this at every level, from you know obviously Al, but to the cast and the crew, and you know the the, the Roku people who you know worked really hard to 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 do something different for for Roku. Um, you know you guys who you know evangelize this. Um, so early on from the beginning, and and I just uh, I I I know I am uh, just a, a small kind of piece in this, and most mostly just a, a fan and audience member. Um, and so to be able to you know put this on my on my own resume as something I got to be involved with, and to be able to tell you know my family that I was a part of this um, is is I'm just so grateful for. And I just want to also say because I'm sure he probably will listen to this too, like. Al, uh, Al is the hero that you want to meet when they say, you know, don't meet your heroes. He, he is that, that, that guy. And, uh, um, may more people, uh, 
wield their success the way that he does because uh, the world would be a much better place if they did. A huge thank you to Colin Davis for chatting with us. What an insightful interview. I love that Colin shared so much about the film with us. Oh, absolutely. And from all of us here at Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast, we can't say it enough, but a huge thank you to Colin for greenlighting Weird the Al Yankovic story. Weird the Al Yankovic story has brought so many smiles to people's faces, and with all the awards the film has won, it clearly was the right choice. This episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota uh, uh, beautiful, it's also very cold. This week, the weather forecast for Darwin, Minnesota is very cold, with average temperature for the week not expected to reach positive numbers on the Fahrenheit scale. Yikers! The high temperature this week is expected to reach 6 degrees Fahrenheit, with the low temperature hovering around negative 12 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, what are those temperatures in Celsius? Uh, well, uh, it's impossible to say for certain. Literally, nobody remembers how to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. Oh, I do. You subtract 32, then you multiply that result by five-ninths. Okay, wise guy. Then you do the conversion. Oh, uh, that sounds hard, and you know what? I-, I-, I suddenly forgot the formula. See? I told you, literally, nobody remembers the formula. Well, at least there's only a 3% chance of snow in Darwin, Minnesota this week. What are we, a weather forecast podcast all of a sudden? Hey, you started it. So visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next wintry expedition. Discover Darwin more than just the twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to attempt to visit discoverdarwin.biz. Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast is brought to you absolutely free thanks to our incredible sponsors, Burrito Burrito, Wizard Burger, our very own Jackson Scoggins, and Discover Darwin. Our podcast is also supported by everyone else in our Patreon family, with special thanks to our amazing close personal friend level Patreon supporters. Zeb, Zach, Blair, Ajax, Gus and Alicia, Adriana, Jake, UH Jeff, Kenneth, Allison, Dana B, Casey, Scotto, Javier, Kev, Ron, Matt. Also thanks to Andrew and everyone else in our pretty stinking majestic Patreon family. If you enjoy our family-friendly Weird Al podcast, as heard in the commentary track on the Weird Al Yankovic Story DVD and Blu-ray, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash 2000inch. There are awesome benefits like getting your name on the podcast, your very own private RSS feed, which gives you early access to each and every single bonus episode, as well as the self-satisfaction of doing something important with your otherwise pitiful, meaningless existence. When you join, you'll be the very first to hear our bonus episodes the instant that they drop. And don't forget to check out our official merchandise over at shop.2000inch.com. All proceeds from purchases go directly towards supporting our fine podcast. We love hearing from our listeners and other Weird Al fans, so be sure to join our Facebook community over at group.2000inch.com and make sure you visit our Discord server for even more riveting Weird Al and Red Rump the Goody related conversations. You can find both of them linked on our website, as well as information about past episodes and guests over at 2000inch.com or weirdalpodcast.com. Keep up on new episodes, podcast news, and events by following at 2000inch on Facebook, X, Threads, and Instagram. And be sure to subscribe everywhere you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. Not only does subscribing help the podcast, if you take your age and subtract one and then add one to it, you will get your exact age. Wow! Mind-blowing. Plus, we also love it when we receive voicemail via official, patent-pending, 27-hour-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula, as seen in the Illustrated Al, the songs of Weird Al Yankovic. That number is 347-772-8852. Give it a call or a text, and you might even hear your message in a future episode. Thank you once again to our guest, Colin Davis, for joining us this episode. We also wish to thank Justin Cohen, John Katz, Jill Hinton, our very own UH Jeff Nucera, Claire Walsh, Zeb Lemke, Eric Appel, and thank you to the Grammy Award winning Jim Kima West for our incredible podcast theme song. And thank you to the Emmy Award winning Weird Al Yankovic, as this podcast probably would not exist without him. And a big thank you to all of you, our loyal listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters and sponsors, and everyone else who makes our podcast possible. 
Thank you for choosing Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. And until next time, remember to gill and chill, keep listening to Weird Al, and stay cheesy! Okay, you know how they keep saying now that Weird Al has won an Emmy, he's halfway to an EGOT? Yes, I do. But who are they? I don't know. Probably all those background actors in the Cobra Pit scene that aren't us. Oh yeah, you're definitely right. Well, for people who might not know, EGOT stands for Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. Arguably the four most prestigious arts awards. Right, and Alice won both at least one Grammy and one Emmy, so he's halfway there. Yeah, and that's actually quite impressive, but I really think they are underselling Al's accomplishments by saying he's only halfway to an EGOT. How so? Well, it's much more accurate to say Al is three-fifths of his way to a HEGOT. EGOT? What does the H stand for? Well, why don't you take a guess? Hamster? No. Hamsters? No. Hacker? No. Haberdasher? No. Harry Potter? Yes. Wait, really? No. Happy? Handy? Hemorrhoid? I give up, Dave. Ethan, how easily you forget. The H stands for Hollywood star. Weird Al is three-fifths of his way to a he Oh, that's why I couldn't guess it. You're thinking of an egg hot. An egg hot? Hey, I don't make the rules. That was Dave and Ethan's 2008 Weird Al Podcast, episode 218-inch. With a name like Dave and Ethan's 2008 Weird Al Podcast, it's got to be good. (laughs) 